Welcome to Airway Breathing Conversation, a podcast presented by the anesthesiology residents at the University of Saskatchewan, created to provide individuals of all levels of medical knowledge with anesthesiology-related healthcare information. On this episode, we speak with Allison Houseman, a Saskatoon teacher specializing in working with young people with complex needs, where she discusses her approach to individuals with neurodivergent conditions, including managing communication, behavior, and perioperative expectations. Now, whether you are an anesthesiologist, resident, medical student, or member of the general public, come take a break with our host, Anesthesia PGY4, Alex Pellerin, and a multitude of brilliant and insightful guests as we demystify the incredible specialty that is anesthesiology, one episode at a time. Welcome, welcome everyone um, to Every Breathing Conversation. We have an awesome uh, episode for today that hopefully will be a part of a bigger three-part episode in the future. But to start us off as, uh, you know, best person, first person, um, is going to be one of my best friends uh, for 34 years, Mm -hmm. um, Allison Houseman, Mm -hmm. who uh, is an autism specialist. And today what we're going to talk about is um, patients with autism coming to the operating room and how we can be uh, better prepared and more understanding and empathetic to hopefully provide uh, better care. Mm-hmm. So yeah, mm-hmm. welcome, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. I also recently said that I wasn't going to do any more episodes of the podcast the last time we filmed because I'm going to start studying for my Royal College exam. But psych, this may be the last one, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Happy to be a part of it then, yeah. just in case it's just the in last case one. my last one. <laughs> I will probably be back. Okay. I'll just keep threatening to leave and then I'll just keep coming back. There It'll you be go. one of those episodes. Um, yeah. So tell us about your education journey, Allison. Okay, great. So um, I got my Bachelor of Education at the University of Saskatchewan about 15 years ago. And while I was in university, I was also an educational assistant with the Catholic school system here. And so I was casual and I would get put in different positions all the time. So sometimes I was working in grade three, supporting a young person with ADHD. And sometimes I was more in a functional life skills program. And that was supporting just a bunch of students with higher needs, um, sometimes physical, sometimes autism, sometimes complex medical. And uh, that was definitely where I enjoyed my time the most. Um, So while I was in education, I skipped way more education classes than I should probably admit, because I found I was getting so much out of going into different schools all the time and taking on these temporary contracts. So I enjoyed it a lot. I actually graduated um, and got a position with the public school division quite quickly, teaching music, drama and dance, um, which I have some background in, but that's not what I study for. I actually am an English and chemistry teacher. Um, and I've never taught either of those things in I my whole career. I didn't know you were a chemistry teacher. I know. I didn't know Isn't that, that at wild? All. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> so Incredible. I, yep, uh, don't ask me to do any chemistry now. Um, <laughs> but I uh, finished, got that position. And then once I was at that school, I wasn't on a full-time contract, but like 0.75 or something. Um, but then to extend my contract, they asked me to do some helping with some learning assistance. And um, a lot of those individuals were students with autism or different diagnoses or were still undiagnosed because it's tricky and especially 15 years ago took a long time for these students to Mm -hmm. access what they needed. So um, I started helping more complex students, which I really enjoyed. And then I worked closely with their educational assistants to make sure that the music drama dance part was really accessible. And um I mean, part of my personal life kind of fell apart during that year, which was a blessing in disguise. Um, But I worked with a lot of teachers who were women, um, very similar to the position I'm in now with two young children, 35-ish, but had never really left Saskatchewan and were, I think, kind of in the throes of, man, I wish I would have moved somewhere different just to try something different and feeling a bit stuck. And just the situation I was in and the stories I was telling about my partner at the time, they were like, you know what, you should just move away. You Mm -hmm. don't own anything. You should just, just go, just go. So I packed up and I moved to England kind of on a whim. Originally I was moving there to teach at an all boys school to teach advanced place English and chemistry. (laughs) And then uh, about a month before I um, left, I actually got a phone call from the agency 
who determined where I was placed. And they asked, um, after looking closer to my CV, it looks like you have a lot of experience with individuals with complex needs. Would you be interested in trying a school um, that has people that just like need more assistance? And I said, yeah, sure. That sounds fine. Whatever. Um, they said the school's in special measures. And I said, that sounds great. And I got there and didn't realize that that means the school is failing technically by the um, English standards. So oh. um, it means, so there's Ofsted in England. I don't know. Are you familiar with this? No. Okay. No. So Ofsted, I don't even know what it stands for, but they assess education and healthcare and they go into, you know, government run anything mm -hmm. and they give you about 24 hours notice maybe it's 48, to get every all of your paperwork in line. And I can't really speak to the healthcare side, mm -hmm. but if you're a teacher, you have to like present all of your plans, all of your data, everything that you're planning on doing for the rest of the year, mm -hmm. um, what questions you're asking, how you know what, where students are, like everything needs to be presented so that if the Ofsted man or woman comes to look through your things, everything needs to be there. They watch you teach. They speak with students to see how they're doing. They call on parents. And it's just like a huge overhaul of, I guess, overview of what mm -hmm. everybody is doing. Um, and special measures means that the last time they came, you are not doing well. <laughs> so they, right. I think there's outstanding, passing, special measures and then total failure. So special measures means not only are they going to come more often, they're going to be more thorough, which I did not realize. Right. So teaching um, music, drama and dance meant I planned a lot of flash mobs because that was really cool in 2010. That was very cool in 2010. Yeah. yeah. And so um, I actually had almost no experience planning lessons for students that had such varying needs where I had some students that were in grade year 10 yeah. that couldn't read at all. And then I had some students that were visually impaired. I had some students that responded better to sign language, um, some that could respond to visual schedules. And all of this was absolutely news to me, <laughs> other than when I had been an educational assistant and someone had presented me with these materials. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it was really hard. <laughs> and yeah. I worked at the school and it was for students with moderate learning difficulties, but it had a satellite autism specialty program. Um, and I found my way kind of really, uh, I lured to the aut autistic students that were there. Mm -hmm. And I uh, loved um, one of the boys there, specifically Luke, was definitely like my reason for pursuing autism specifically. He had a lot of behavioral um, difficulties where it was just hard for him to sit still. It was hard for him to understand how other people were feeling even though he was um, very expressive. And uh, yeah, it was, it, we had a really cool bond. So we, he responded really well to the way I was teaching, which was great. Um, so the end of that year, I taught there for one year, learned a lot, getting observed all the time, became an infinitely better teacher than when I started because I knew what people were looking for. And mm -hmm. I had to write down and make everything more clear so that anybody could read it and understand what I was trying to say. So it was actually really helpful. Um, but my head teacher at that school told me, you know, there's a school called Treehouse in the, um, in London, because I was just outside of London. And I think you should, you should go for it. If you can go there, I think that would be a good fit for you. Mm -hmm. So Treehouse is an independent school in North London in a very fancy area. That Does that kind I, of mean like private, like independent kind of like private? It's different. So it's still funded by um, sometimes parents, but mm -hmm. like very infrequently because it was really expensive to go mm. there just because the staffing ratios were so high. I see. And the building was so new and like it was kind of top of the line stuff at, um, when I was there. Mm -hmm. But then lots of it is uh, the local authorities pay for it. So we'd have gotcha. students that were coming from all over. So anyway, I took a shot in the dark, applied for this job. I in no way thought I was qualified for, um, interviewed and got the position. And I worked there for four years. Um, and so I started as a teacher kind of across four classrooms, like overseeing the literacy and numeracy and that kind of piece. Um, and then the next year, uh, again, I was kind of drawn to the more challenging behavior type of thing. So I was given um, a class of six young men that had extreme challenging behavior. Um, they were, what grade? I don't know. Probably eight was the youngest and then 12 was the oldest. Mm -hmm. And three of them were staffed with two staff members to one um, just to ensure their safety. 
um, because they could engage in some pretty risky things to Mm -hmm. themselves and to others. So I had my six boys and I had a huge, amazing team. So I led that for a year. And then I, um, again, shot in the dark. The, there was a, an assistant head teacher position for the lower school. So that meant primary grades. And I applied for that and then um, moved up there. And then I did that for two years before I moved home to Saskatoon mm-hmm. <laughs> and then helped open a senior autism program at John Dolan School, which is where I currently am. Um, I'm currently not in an autism program, mm-hmm. um, but that's just been autism programs have been what I've been doing since 2011. So Mm -hmm. autism specific stuff. So along then with, in terms of education and training, um, I have a special education certificate. Again, from the U of S, I have a lot of ABA, applied behavior analysis training um, from Treehouse in the UK. And then just a bunch of other kind of, um, there's like different restraint or response to crisis kind of intervention stuff Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. I'm certified in. And then I help train other people just to like responding to tricky situations. Mm-hmm. So that's where I'm at now. Incredible. Yeah. That is quite the journey. That was a long story. No, that yeah. was a good story yeah. though. It was very yeah. engaging. Okay, and good. even though- okay. um, You kind of know it, I guess. Well, yeah, that's, well, that's what I thought was so interesting about it because I kind of, I knew the story, yeah. but not in like that uh, level of detail. And mm. I, it's, I guess it just like speaks to like when, because you're very charismatic. And I think you've always been like really amazing at your job, how those like opportunities just happen. And then you can just like swoop in there and take them. Um, wow. Incredible. And then um, you have also, because when we were talking about this before, you also mentioned that uh, when people have had to come for surgery mm-hmm. or different procedures to the hospital, you've also helped um, prep students. Yes. Um, so what does that process sort of look like? Because I bet I would would think most of us have no idea that that actually happens. So it really depends. So I've worked with individuals with autism that can tell you like, I'm feeling very anxious and I'm going to like go outside and go for a jog. Mm -hmm. Or I've worked with students that are completely nonverbal. And despite like they may have an iPad with a communication device or they may have symbols that they can exchange for certain things, they really don't have a way to express when they are upset or Mm -hmm. um, if they are uncomfortable. Sometimes students are in the way that they are able to be led more easily because of this. Like if they um, just maybe don't have like the cognitive understanding of what's going on, sometimes you can't just like literally lead them by the hand and put them in the car and be like, we're going to the hospital. And like, that's kind of it. But even with students like that, we always try to, we work with the parents very closely, Mm -hmm. or if they're in care, we work with their home and sometimes social workers. And we just make sure that they... um, We'll write like a little social story. So do you know what that is? No, I don't know what it is. I write a lot of them now for my two and a half year old as well. So (laughs) we, a social story is, um, for example, me coming to this podcast. This is my social story. I'd say Um, on Sunday at 9.30 a.m., your friend Alex is going to pick you up in her blue car to drive you to the hospital. And so I'd have like a picture of a blue car, a picture of the hospital, a picture of Alex. And then it would say, you're going to drive across the bridge and you park your car in the garage. That's it. And then you would say exactly what's going to happen. We're going to walk through the store. We're going to see this bizarre artwork. Um, We're going to walk up three flights of stairs and then we're going to sit at a table, but don't tap it and make sure you're sitting this close to my phone and whatever. So you'd be like really, really specific mm, with a lot of pictures. I see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so some students that can't read, it it doesn't matter. The whole idea is just exposure to like what you can be expecting. Mm, Often mm-hmm. these social stories go home um, so that they can be read through with their families as well. Um, and a big piece of it for our students, when they can't really communicate how anxious they are, you can tell how anxious they are because of how anxious their families are. Right. So a lot of it is supporting parents as well with just like working. Um, we've worked with nurses and doctors before too, so that we can have a really clear understanding of exactly what to expect so right. that everybody is just in the loop beforehand. Um, when we do know Um, for example, like, oh, like they're probably going to take your blood pressure or they're probably going to, they might give you an IV or Mm -hmm. you might have to lay down. If we know those kind of things, we could practice those at school as well. So we do a lot of like the blood pressure one is fun. We have like a blood pressure thing and we do that. Um, at John Dolan, we have two nurses that are working full time at our school, just with the nature of the complex needs of our students. Yeah. So they have a lot of the medical equipment there. So because of, uh, the needs of some of our students, they already are exposed to nurses and like the day-to-day tasks 
that a nurse might be doing. So mm-hmm. even like finger pokes, taking oxygen levels. Right. Um, some of our students like receive like asthma care with masks um, in different programs, not mine specifically, I don't think. They um, have like different protocols with like oxygen masks and mm. everything like that. Or what's it called when you have your oxygen thing and you carry it around? Is oh, it like um, if you had like nasal prongs and yeah. you're on oxygen therapy, yes. like okay. long-term. There's a few of those students. Mm-hmm. So um, so yeah, so lots of our students are familiar with medical care. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it comes to like a bigger thing, mm-hmm. um, I know dental work and anesthesia yes. is something that we work on really carefully because I think opening your mouth um, so many students with autism do have sensory issues around putting things in their mouth where mm-hmm. either it's like they have pica where they want to eat things that are inedible and like are constantly putting things in their mouth yeah. or the opposite where it's just like they only eat goldfish crackers and, or like three specific things just because of a texture issue or right. something like that. So, right. um, we work with like that kind of exposure as well. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Cause you know, I, uh, it's funny because we, for adults and children, I try to always tell them, um, you know, like this is kind of what's going to happen mm-hmm. when you come in the room. So I didn't even realize um, that we sort of already do that. This like s- kind of, kind of mm-hmm. like social story priming, yep. although it's very short, a very yep. short window of yep. time. Um, and we do give the kids um, masks a lot, yep. like the masks that we would use to hook up to our, our ventilator. Right we let them like hold that and like put that on their little bear and like put that on themselves and put a smell in it and make it a little bit more palatable. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, practicing things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that like makes so much sense to me, practicing things way ahead of time and then just getting people used to it. That's Yeah, the social story part does work well. Um, Sometimes we can, if, if we are ahead of the curve enough, we can also just like ask for a video of someone like taking a video of the room of what it's going to look like. Right. Um, a lot of our students like respond a bit better to videos rather than pictures and everything too. Um, I had another thought about, oh, the masks. My mm-hmm. daughter just recently had tubes in her ears. Right. And that was, right. she, they were, she, okay, I don't know who the anesthesiologist was, but he was a man with a mustache and it was November 30th that we had this procedure. Was, was he really tall and yes. thin? Yeah. I bet it was Dr. Krichinski. Yes, it was. Okay, perfect. Because I asked He's him. very lovely. I was like, I thought afterwards, I was like, is this offensive to ask? But I was like, do you have this mustache all the time? Implying like, I know it's November, but he's like, no, I guess to go today. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but he was great. And hers smelled like strawberries. And he explained the whole thing to me. And yeah. and they were so great explaining it to these little kids. Because my daughter was is two and a half. And she was the youngest by far getting this procedure on mm-hmm. like all the five beds in a row. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, they explained it really well to a two and a half year old all the way up to a seven year old, I think was the oldest. Mm-hmm. So it was very cool. And you just had it done at um, Prairie View? Yeah. Surgical center. Nice. It was great. Nice. Oh, yeah. I wish you could leave reviews for that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it was well, great. Yeah, was- I, th- they, I think they work really hard there to try to make. And and it's, a you know, also a place where they, like multiple yeah. people get done per day. It was very bizarre. Yeah. Just to have the like all these little kids on their beds with their yeah. little pajamas. It was like 645 in the morning. Yeah. GG. I could tell you everyone's name, too, because they were so clear. Yeah. And like delivering instructions. Yeah. It was great. It was that's great. awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you guys had a really good experience. It was awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. excellent. It took eight minutes. Yeah, it's a very quick yes. procedure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a very quick procedure. Yeah. Wild. Yeah. Um, yeah, so lovely. But yeah, we I think we do try really hard to, or we want people to feel really comfortable. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just sometimes challenging, um, like you said, when um, maybe people haven't been primed in that way. Mm-hmm. Or yeah, you, maybe they're a little bit older and you're like, we actually do need a blood pressure before you go Mm -hmm. off to sleep, or we do kind of need an IV before you go off to sleep for safety. Um, Then I think it can be a little bit more tricky. I guess so. I could like some tips, I suppose. Yeah, tell me some tips. Yeah. Is um, when using words, it's always worth assuming they can understand what you're saying, Mm -hmm. even if how they present is maybe leading you to believe otherwise. So right. uh, that's like a really lovely part about John Dolan is that we have some students that it, to the naked eye, appears that this student is sleeping in their wheelchair all day. But the tone and everything that everyone does for the student all day mm-hmm. is you still speak to them um, and you speak through them, if that makes sense. So I think an older school way of... Uh, 
maybe working with this type of student would be to talk over them or to um, just talk to the other adult that's providing care right. and just exchanging uh, information over them. Um, but one thing that I'm just so proud of at our school is the way that students, even if they appear to be sleeping, even if they appear not to be interested at all, mm -hmm. are involved in the conversation. Mm. So for example, Greg, little Greg is in his wheelchair. Um, it's time for the nurse to come check his oxygen because it's almost lunchtime. We're going to hook him up to his G-tube. We always just say, it's like, oh, Greg, it looks like the nurse is coming down the hall. All right, Greg, do you, you don't mind if I quickly take your oxygen, do you? And like any information that you're delivering about the student could mm -hmm. be to the student, if that makes sense. Right. Even if they're not able to be like, yep, sounds good. Yeah. It's, but like that's, um, I guess, a tip I would I would use too. So right. it's like for, for anybody. Yeah, and it's then, always addressing them. Yes. Yeah. And then once you're talking more about procedural things um, with either their caregivers, if they're in the room too, or to this individual, and you're not sure how much information they're able to actually receive and take on, I would just say removing filler words is also really useful. And mm -hmm. like less is more. So instead of being like, oh my gosh, I mean, I can't even pretend to know like medical things that you would have to tell a kid. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to like draw on my Grey's Anatomy knowledge yeah. of like, all right, we're going to give you 15 cc's of this and yeah, like yeah. don't move a muscle because we need to do this or something. Instead, yeah. you would just be like, we're going to put in the needle. We sit still or something like it's just less is more to right. just be able to like right. be really, really clear. Yeah. Tone is really important, which I think in general, like especially I've never met an anesthesiologist I didn't love. And I feel like their bedside manner is always incredible. So Thank I think you. that's not an issue because <laughs> yeah. they, I spoke to two lovely anesthesiologists when I had epidurals, which I could also talk all day about how much I loved that experience. Yeah. Um, and they are so calm yes. and relaxed yeah. and delivering information without it's, it's factual but sensitive, I suppose. So mm -hmm. I think there's no issue there. I would just say like that kind of tone is perfect for like handling that type of thing. Right. I would say there's always the risk before whatever you're dosing them with hits. The, um, I mean, the fear and like the fight or flight response that a, an individual might encounter. I have seen this before where it's like, it does present as sort of like a violent outburst Right. Um, which yeah. I suppose doctors are used to. <laughs> so yeah. I, and I imagine if you were going to perform a procedure on this type of patient, you would be brief before anyway, kind of knowing it's like, by the way, sometimes his arms like flail out really fast and just right. like having that kind of support in place before. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess you guys probably do that anyway. Yeah, we definitely have, have those things. Like I, I did a, um, a child not that long ago for an MRI. Yeah. Um, and he, uh, lives at Hope's home. Okay. I'm familiar with Hope's home. We have a few students at my school. Yeah. And so, he, yeah. um, you know, like most children, I always find them shockingly strong. Yes. And, well, especially uh, when you're angry, you could lift a car. You're angry, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, and it's always, it's always tough, especially when we're going into an MRI machine because, um, uh, often a uh, caregiver can't come into the MRI because they have to be like demagnetized and not have any metal on them and things like that. And I find that can sometimes be really tricky because obviously they're most comfortable with right. people that they see every day. Um, and you can't bring anything in there with you. Like it's any, not like you can watch your iPad while you're No, in exactly. MRI. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's the other thing too yeah. is like it kind of eliminates a lot of good distraction techniques that right. we use in the operating room. Like we have televisions like everywhere in the yeah. operating room or music or whatever. Yep. And you just don't really have that same effect. Um, yeah. And we just ended up kind of have, having to, because he knew, like kids know when mm -hmm. these things are coming. They're like, I've had yes. this experience before and I don't like it, yep. um, which is completely fair. So we kind of just had to like scoop him um, and just sort of like bundle him in a blanket and then just got him off to sleep um, inhaling some anesthetic gas. Yeah. But I'm always like, oh, can we make this better? Because yeah. it must be um, so... I would think like very traumatic yes. when you like know this is coming. Mm -hmm. You're like, I've been here before yeah. and these people just kind of like wrangle me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's for, obviously it's, it's for a good reason. It's because yes. we need to do this medical procedure and it's, it is what is, is best. But, um, and I think now we're much more sensitive mm -hmm. and more empathetic to that experience than yep. we ever have been before in medicine. But mm -hmm. I always think that we could be doing it better. I think that you, I mean, the use of like a blanket or something like that is yeah. so smart, especially yeah. when they're like a smaller kid, or if it is like a weighted blanket and you're able to wrap a oh, bigger yeah, person with it, blanket. just because mm. that is like, um, I mean, I, you can't say all autistic people about anything or all people about anything, but, mm -hmm. um, often they are either seeking deep pressure 
or right. they don't want to be touched at all. <laughs> right. Is, tends to be where most of the students I've worked with have sat. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, you're kind of lucky, I guess, if it's like a sensory seeking kid that like loves to be squeezed. I mean, a weighted mm-hmm. blanket that they're wrapped in, I mean, is probably your best bet. Mm-hmm. And that's a lot better, I suppose, than being held specifically by strangers. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, much, much better. Yeah. yeah. And I guess that's something that I, I don't think I've really ever asked before is like mm-hmm. what, because um, I usually ask like, is this child verbal or non- mm-hmm. nonverbal or yeah. like how do they u- usually communicate? But I don't think I've ever really asked about like sensory deep pressure mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And I think that's a really good thing to sort of carry forward and ask about. Well, it's tough to, it's like, so sensory stuff, um, I guess also that like would be unavoidable, I guess, in like a medical situation like that is Mm -hmm. just sound. So like beeping or buzzing or things that like I wouldn't even register. Sometimes that can be really triggering or lights, fluorescent lights especially can be giving off a sound, but also just like the type of light. So if things Mm. can be like more dim and more relaxed, usually that tends to help a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, in a school setting, if we're presenting an activity or something that a student is less keen to to fulfill or, you know, they're just not that motivated, we often just use like first and then language a mm-hmm. lot. Um, and uh, that kind of carries out throughout their school day. But I actually use it all the time at home with my kids. But it's like, first we're doing this and then we can do this. And usually the then is something more preferred. Right. So usually that is more deliverable in a quick way. Mm-hmm. So being like first MRI and then you get to have a snack. It's like, well, okay. But like, that's yeah, still like pretty. Popsicle or yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Something. But it's, it's, it is worth like having something more rewarding, following something that's mm-hmm. trickier. Mm-hmm. First okay. and then statements. That's good. First and then. And then that also helps you keep your language really simple. Right. Yeah. Because it could even beneficial. be, then doesn't even need to be a reward. It could just be like, okay, first we're going to wrap you in the blanket. Then we're going to lay down. Then the machine's going to go. And then all done or something like that. Mm-hmm. And so if they are being supported, um, by someone that knows them from school, I almost, I have always felt good about attending things like that, where, you know, you're not only are you the familiar face, but Mm -hmm. like they are used to you presenting unpleasant things to them all the time. Right. (laughs) So they're like, oh, okay. Like I know at least this, I know it's going to end, or I know that this is coming later, or I know that something, Mm -hmm. I know that this person will like make good on this promise or. Yeah. Yeah. Like just trustworthiness. Right. Cause yeah, you have to do stuff with them all the time. Yes. Yeah. 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 And then, um, you mentioned talking about, um, like, yeah, sometimes children can get aggressive, obviously Mm -hmm. like not meaning to hurt anybody, but, um, obviously kids can be really big. Mm -hmm. Um, and I recently had, uh, like a younger teenager, but like just as big as I am, yep. who seemed relaxed. And then kind of um, when I was about to start an IV, really turned a corner and ended up um, uh, becoming like a little bit uh, aggressive and a little bit bitey. Mm-hmm. And um, how do you kind of manage those things at, at school when those sorts of things happen? So we do so much work. So we use positive positive behavior interventions and supports, PBIS. Mm-hmm. So we, anytime there's like any instance of challenging behavior in a student, they would have a PBIS plan. So challenging okay. behavior can look anything like biting people, yeah. <laughs> but it could also be, and it could be any aggression, like kicking, hitting, pinching, Right. Whatever. But it could also be escaping. So like running away um, and like mm-hmm. the issue of elopement. Mm-hmm. And it could also be um, self-injury. So we, right. if a student has any of these kind of issues, they have a plan. And so part of the plan is having data tracking, which is like specific objective things that like I, if you were to come to my classroom and I was like, you're working with Greg and like, here's his PBIS data. Like you would be able to take data because it's so clear. Mm-hmm. And it's like, Okay, is he banging his head with force on a window? Mm-hmm. How many times is it? And then there's like a severity scale. So it's just like a one is like a gentle bonk. A two is like the glass is vibrating. And a three is like he's leaving a mark on his own head. Mm-hmm. How many times do you do that between 930 and 945? So we track all of the behavior stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so because of that um, tracking, then we come up with a plan to support how to like reduce these challenging behaviors. So because we're so, um, we are constantly observing and evaluating and taking the data to on board to inform how we treat them. Mm-hmm. I guess that's my very long way of saying, like, we actually just prevent them from happening at all. So Right. So instead yes. of like addressing the behavior after it happens, yes. the idea is preventing but it of from course, before I mean, it starts. If we could do that all the time, Shh, I would have never been bitten before, but... <laughs> I have been bitten plenty of times. <laughs> did you get bitten for real? I, d- I didn't get bitten. Yeah. No, it was a parent that ended up yeah. um, getting bitten. But 
And I, it's just like, it must be so scary. Like I completely understand from the perspective of the patient, yes. how terrifying it must be. And they're just yeah. like, I just don't want to do this. Yeah. Actually, why do I even have to do this? Right. And it's hard, I think, when you're, um, even when you're like a, um, like a neurocognitively, like, um, like more developed child, mm-hmm. even to be like, yeah, I have cancer and yeah. it really sucks. But like, it's hard for you to even see past next week. So of course you don't see sometimes right. like how this treatment will benefit you to grow up and like live a long, he- right. healthy life. Yep. Um, so yeah, I always try to think about that when ki- when kids behave like that. But that's just like, like, ugh. That's such awful. a lovely way to think of it. And that's yeah. really how in general in the, the behavior support program, we think about behavior too, where mm-hmm. it's just like, it is like never personal. Yeah. It's not an attack. Like we don't use words like violence or anything like that or assault or right, every now right. and then we'll have someone come through our classroom where I'm like, this does not seem like a job fit for you, where they will use terms like that, where it's like, oh, he assaulted me twice today. And I'm like, he actually, yeah. he didn't actually. <laughs> yeah. He he hit you twice. Yeah. But it's like, that's actually, assault implies intent to right. hurt. And it's yeah. like, that's not the intention. So behavior is spoken about in a really complex way where we talk about like, what is the function? So what, why is this person, you know, sensory seeking by biting their own hand? Or why did they mm-hmm. feel like they had to like lash out and bite you or whatever? So, um, okay, that said, mm-hmm. I mean, you're in the, let's say you're in the room, you're delivering this anesthesia to somebody. Mm -hmm. You actually are not in the meetings about PBIS, Mm -hmm. nor have you been trained in like Mm -hmm. this kid's specific intervention programs. Mm -hmm. So that to say, if you are encountering an individual that is like starting to become reactive, yes, I would say the best things to kind of remember, and I'm sure you guys are trained in this anyway, for like, I mean, you as a nurse, absolutely. Yeah, definitely as a, as a nurse. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So just like, I guess, keeping yourself safe things is like distance is your friend. Mm-hmm. Um, standing sideways. So kind of having like one foot in front of the other and your body turned sideways, but like your arms open and presented towards the individual who seems like they're escalating is always useful because that kind of keeps your important organs covered just in case they like kick outwards. I suppose so body positioning is something to think about. Yeah. I mean, having your hair back, um, hair pulling is like a very, very common um, thing among autistic kids. And that's just kind of a developmental sensory seeking thing as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So having your hair up or like not available, but I imagine you're probably all. Yeah, we all wear like caps, thankfully, on our heads. That's good. Yes. Yeah. Um, I would say if you knew you had like a, an intense hair puller, wearing like a swim cap is something we'll do and we'll put all of our hair there and then wear a bonus hat on top just because um, hair pullers will often like go the extra mile to make sure they can touch hair. Um, if you are ever getting bit, you feed the bite is the strategy. So the, the impulse is always to pull away, mm-hmm. um, but that's obviously way more dangerous because mm-hmm. that just increases the chance of breaking skin and needing another tetanus shot and whatever. Yeah. Um, so you actually push into the bite. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you actually, like, you could take back their head and like push it in because then it keeps them safe as well. Yeah. And then eventually like their mouth will just go. There's like a lot of like old school tricks that I don't love mm-hmm. um, that people say. It's like plug their nose or something. And I guess if you're like really in a pinch, yeah. sure. Like if you... <laughs> Right. If you felt like you were maybe like being strangled or something or it's like something was really dangerous to you. Yep. Hmm. But there's lots of different like proactive preventative measures. Mm -hmm. And I guess when I was saying distance is your friend, Mm -hmm. it kind of varies by person because sometimes being closer is safer depending what's in the room Um, just for like throwing items, I suppose. Right. So and I would assume if there was like an individual that had a history of like throwing, biting, kicking, that kind of thing, they would be supported by at least one person that knew them well, who would yeah. be able to hopefully give them the comfort that they need um, so that you can at least like put a little gas on them or something to make yeah. sure they're relaxed. But mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. feed the bite. There you go. Feed the bite. Yeah. Okay. That's something I hadn't really, yeah, <laughs> hadn't really thought about before. Yeah. Um, so like if, if say if something happened yep. and it was like in the operating room and someone like jumped off the table and kind of ran mm-hmm. into a corner or whatever, mm-hmm. how would you like tell us to sort of like handle that situation to get them kind of back on the bed to help, help put them to sleep? I would say like, t- I mean, if time is something that's on your side, I would give them like a little bit of space. Yeah. And mm-hmm. um, often in a really high intensity situation like that, 
time seems like it's moving really slowly, but it's not. So it's just like, you're like, okay, I really, but like, we need to do this in the next 10 minutes. Mm. It's like, if you can give them the first five to just like relax and Mm -hmm. recoup and then slowly have the person that's helping you support them back to where you need them to be. If you can take things to meet them where they are, I feel like that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, Something that I am remind, like I'm learning all the time now that I have like kids of my own Mm -hmm. and um, like right now, like as, as far as I can tell, my, my toddler is typically developing. Mm -hmm. And so in a lot of ways, cognitively, she's surpassed a lot of the students I've worked with for years. Mm -hmm. And so seeing how she, you know, has a tantrum or has, is going through a really difficult thing and can't express like why she's so upset. And then, um, I guess my example is for a while there, she really wanted to just drive the car. So she like would get in her car seat, but crawl over and she would sit in the front seat and she wanted to drive the car. Mm -hmm. So for the first bit, Uh, My husband would try and like you try and put a toddler into a car seat, which if anyone has ever tried to do that when they are upset, it is honest. It is like fighting. Right. Because they like ride their bodies all crazy. They're so strong (laughs) and they're so flexible and you're just whatever. So I think we did that a couple times. And then I was like, you know what? It actually, if we just get into the car one minute earlier and put her in the front seat and say, okay, you can drive for 10 seconds and then honk the horn. Mm -hmm. That actually is going to knock off five minutes of our journey. So it's like, we're not actually adding time. We're actually taking time away. It's actually going right. to get there faster. Right. So I don't know. So that's something I think about a lot with my toddler. But now I'm looking forward to employing with my students as well. Where it's just like, if you have the time mm-hmm. to, you know, meet them where they are, I would just do that. And mm-hmm. in the long run, you're actually saving time. Because <laughs> yeah. I know you guys probably run where it's like, you probably are, you know, like I have to do this because then I have to go to like the fourth floor to do this and whatever. Like, it's not yeah. like you, you don't have an hour to yeah. spend. So yeah, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But often giving space is like, I guess, the number one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. Nice. <laughs> and then what sort of things, because you were talking about, um, like, say, for um, that kiddo that was like headbanging in yeah. the window. Yeah. So what kind of things do you do to try to prevent that behavior? So that would be, I guess, headbanging is a really interesting one. So we always think about like, okay, what is the function of this behavior? And so headbanging right. can be lots of things. Often it's pain. So like often mm. it's like they have a headache, which I mean, if you've ever had a migraine, which I think you have. I, all the time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, you know, when you have like those really unreasonable thoughts when you're on like hour five of a migraine and yeah. you're like, I actually feel like if I just was to like drill like right here right, and then leak out my head or if I hit my head hard enough on this window, I bet it would feel like better for like a second. Yeah. 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 So it's just like, I think just taking that on board and being like, that's what that kid is trying to do. Or if you have like a sore hangnail or something and then you press it because it hurts like for a second and you're like, okay, but then it's temporary relief. Right. It's, I think often that's one of the functions. So, but sometimes it's for attention. Right. And it's like um, looking for an adult to give them any attention um, and say like, oh, don't do that. Or Greg, be careful or whatever. Mm -hmm. So instead just proactively giving them attention for other things um, so that they don't feel the need to do some sort of self-injury. But almost always self-injury is related to pain. Of some huh. sort. So investigating that with the nurses and mm-hmm. there's always like a checklist where it's like, okay, are they, how are we physiologically? Like, are we in pain? Yeah. Are we hungry? Are we thirsty? How are our bowels? And then after that, it's like, okay, students are ready to learn. But gotcha. it's like, there's a lot. But if you think about it, I'm like, I'm the same way. Oh, I think we're all the same way, yeah. right? We all get like, um, we had an episode where we talked about like being on call. Yeah. And how it's really easy to get grumpy at like 3 a.m. when you realize, oh, I haven't really like gone to the bathroom or yep. eaten anything or drank yep. anything. And now this like um, a situation, this uh, communication situation is now seeming incredibly daunting mm-hmm. or like come, going to a trauma. It just seems yep. like, oh, I don't know if I can manage yep. it. It's like probably because you just need to take like a few yeah, have you some know, water. there are times where you can't take a few minutes, but like when you, after that's done, you should take a few minutes mm-hmm. and just be like, okay, I'm going to do these few things, yeah. these life things, these like basic needs. Yes. And then I'll feel better. That's often, I mean, I think that's probably a big similarity in like medical mm-hmm. field as well as like special education and social work. Like I think those like intense caregiver type of jobs yeah. where it is, it's, I mean, I see it all the time at school where it's just like people are like, I actually don't know that I ate and it's four o'clock. Mm-hmm. And you're just like, Right. But like, you should take your lunch break and stuff like that if you can. Mm-hmm. But if you can, yeah. And mm-hmm. then they wonder why they exactly are so grumpy and, you know, need to hit McDonald's on the way home and totally pass out in front of their TV. I'm like, oh, I got that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And there, and is there anything specific that you kind of do to keep yourself, like you mentioned, um, positioning and distance, but is there any other things that you do to try to keep yourself safe at work that we could maybe like employ as well? I mean, if you, we do wear like some PPE. Mm -hmm. So if there was an individual that came in, it's like, they are like an extreme biter. Mm -hmm. They, like there are like, they kind of look like shin pads that you wear everything. Um, Another thing that works if you're worried about bites is jean jackets, which like everyone kind of has a jean jacket in their closet. Right. But like something stronger. Yeah. Wearing something stronger. If we ever like are running low on PPE, then we'll just bring jean jackets in from Valley Village. And because they're just, they're hard to bite through. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We'll do that. That's really good. Yeah. Um, Not wearing glasses, I guess, is something that we'll do. Like wear contact lenses, putting up your hair. Yeah. Clothes that are no jewelry, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I think all that's probably pretty similar to what. Yeah. Because we all wear like lanyards or. Do they snap um, off? They, um, ours like have a, a thing, I think probably if you didn't have like a, um, yeah, something that was going on, it would probably just be better to just take it off yep. ahead of time or like take all the pens out of your pockets. Mm-hmm. Um, cause we talk a lot about wearing things, we wear things around our neck all the time. Yep. And it's funny cause when I was a nurse, I was like, don't wear things around mm-hmm. your neck because that's could be a safety concern. Yep. Like someone could use it to hurt you. Um, but physicians do it constantly. Hmm. We wear like our stethoscopes around our neck or like lanyards or have pens. And sometimes when dealing, um, with different patient populations, you do kind of, you are kind of like hovering over top of them right. at times. And yep. that's just like not pleasant if something falls out of your pocket. That's true. Onto and someone. Someone to their- <laughs> yeah. Like that's not good. I've dropped my phone on my baby's face before. And I'm yeah. like, this, I imagine that's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you don't, obviously you don't mean to have these things yeah. happen, but definitely that's something that we think about, especially when, um, we do like neonates or like really small kids mm-hmm. and you are definitely like kind of, they're so small. You're like yeah. hovering over top of them all the time. You just empty everything. Yep. Um, off your neck and your face and your pockets just to make sure that that you're not going to yeah. cause any undue harm. That's a good and sense. Do you guys have like are you scent free? We have yeah, we're yeah. supposed to be scent. Supposed to be yeah. scent free. We the, are at our hospital. hospital. Too. Yeah. Cuz I think that sometimes can be kind of a, a like thing. a bit of a triggering thing. What else do I do? I think in general like I mean it comes with experience where it's just like I I mean it's so easy for me to sit here and be like yeah like position your body correctly and yeah, put up your hair and I'm yeah. like I've it's because I've learned all those things the very hard way yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean so and eventually those things happen to you enough or you witness them happening to someone else enough that you are a bit desensitized which mm-hmm. I mean that cannot be news to doctors and mm-hmm. nurses who are like obviously desensitized to a lot of things right yeah yeah indeed. <laughs> so you do um you get used to it. And then there's also like a sliding scale of like what you would even consider a big deal. Where like, I remember once I got sort of pinched as an EA sub when mm-hmm. I was 19. Mm-hmm. And I think I probably talked about it for two weeks. Whereas like now I had a pincher in my class before I went on maternity leave. And it was like black and blue under my arms every day. I didn't even think about it. Like I was like, I would write down the data, but I was like, oh, I'm not going to like bring this up at a party. Like this is just kind of like, well, whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it was just like a normal part of my job that's now. Just, that's just Dylan or whoever. Yeah, you know? or whoever. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I think mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's the same thing yeah. in medicine. Because like at first you're like, wow, this trauma, that was right. crazy. I can't believe I saw this. And then sort of by the time... Well, especially like for me, I'm sort of like finally nearing the end of some of my training. I'm like, okay, I've actually like seen all that, this yeah. crazy stuff yep. already. Like, um, not that it isn't still like in the moment and ind- adrenaline inducing, totally. but you're sort of like, well, okay, like I've kind of been there, been there yep. before, and uh, I'll uh, probably be there again. Yes, <laughs> at some point. Yep, it'll happen again. And the next yeah. time it happens, you're just better equipped. Yeah, yeah. And you guys do so much reflection as well, where it's just, I mean, this podcast is literally an example. Yeah, I guess (laughs) it is an example of reflection. (laughs) I'm just like, oh, and this happened. Like, what could I have done instead? It's just like, there's so much of that in special ed as well. Yes. Where it's just like, wow, this room got super trashed today. And that kid really, like a couple people got really hurt. And like, what are we going to do tomorrow? And like Mm -hmm. having to like just come up with a big plan. And it is pretty amazing to work in this field with such incredible like-minded people Mm -hmm. who all talk about things the same way Mm -hmm. because it would be, I could see for people that are totally have no job that's even close to this Yeah, would be like, you would see it and you'd be like, wow, like that kid is really dangerous. 
And like, what are you even going to do? Like, he doesn't, he shouldn't be at school. You should send him home. Like this, is, this room is trash. Like, what mm-hmm. does he not respect the, these books? Like, what are, <laughs> yeah, and it's just like, ridiculous. I, like I can that. see how some people would see that and could speak that way. But like these meetings, it like, sometimes people are like all holding their ice packs and they're like, but you know what he did do? He used his iPad and he actually, at the end, he said, I want chips. And we're all like, isn't that amazing? Mm-hmm. And we're just like missing a tooth. <laughs> and you're still just like, but good for him. Like he did. And it's just, it's really cool. It's cool mm-hmm. to like work with people that get it. <laughs> mm-hmm, that get it. That's actually what I found really interesting um, now that we're adults. Yep. And we have very different jobs. But I think one thing that is the same in both of our jobs mm-hmm. is like always thinking with like a growth mindset. Yes. Yep. Um, lots of reflection mm-hmm. and like trying to approach problems from a different way. Yes. Um, which um, I don't think I even really appreciated until we had this discussion today to be like, wow, I think that's why even as adults, we get along so well yeah. and like we can yeah. have such good conversations I agree. because, yeah, yeah cause we like have to, we have these problems that like come up in our work and you have to be like, actually I got to come around from a different perspective to this. Like knowing yes. all the things that I know and like all the tools in my toolbox, yeah. like how can we make this better next time? Well, and I think we're, I think alike, we're alike in a lot of ways. And mm-hmm. I think too, it's just like, we are so stubborn to solve a problem. Oof. And also we just like really like to be right. Yes. And we have <laughs> oldest daughters. Syndrome. And we're oldest daughters. <laughs> and like, there's just so many things where I'm like, I do love to be proven wrong. Like, yes, I, me I, too, actually. I love it. Yeah. But at, at the same time, I'm like, I love to be a part of something that really works. Mm-hmm. And so like, if we can mm-hmm. like solve a problem and then a kid can like absolutely skyrocket and use communication and we do get to see those behaviors go down because they feel like loved and accepted and they feel understood. Like, oh my gosh, there's nothing better. Mm-hmm. I'm really like, rewarding. I, I have not done cocaine, but I imagine that's what it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the excellent high. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. And yeah. then do you have any tips for like, because um, you kind of mentioned before, it's uh, really comforting for children to be around people who mm-hmm. they have like trust with. Yep. Yeah. Um, but something that I find really interesting is sometimes, and e- even in kids who are not uh, neurodiverse, sometimes I find their parents can be not a com- like comforting source. Mm-hmm. Like if a parent, you know, like sometimes like if a parent is really anxious and yes. they're like, why are you anxious? Do I need to be anxious? Mm-hmm. Like what is going on in this situation? So do you have any like sort of tips about how we could sort of navigate that or make that better for people? Because I don't want to... Um, I don't ever want to tell a parent like, oh, I kind of think maybe. Can you calm down, please? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I, yeah, exactly. Oh, you don't like, think I people never respond to... well? To yeah, that. yeah, people. Yeah, from experience, people don't really yeah. respond well to that. So I'm just wondering, like, how can I support these two people um, that are kind of coming at it from like different perspectives? I suppose. I guess, like, I I wonder if communicating through the per, like the individual that the procedure is actually happening with. Like, oh, so yeah, involving, instead of talking yeah. directly only to the parents. Involving yeah. the kid, I think, would help the parents see that the p- medical people understand what's going on, mm. I suppose, or, like, mm-hmm. are understanding the gravity of, like, what the behaviors might be or mm-hmm. whatever. So I think that's probably useful. Um, okay, other tips. I guess, like, because, I, I mean— I'm just going from like the anesthesiologist I know. So yes. there's like five of you. Yeah. And I <laughs> you know well. Yeah. yeah. That I'm just kind of thinking, I'm like, well, I imagine what you're already doing would be so useful. So it's mm-hmm. like you're coming in, pr- producing the facts. You're probably asking, you know, questions that are helping warm up the family. Mm-hmm. I imagine that, I don't know. You're just like all four, like all of you guys are so nice that I, and that's so really kind of you. Thank you. Calm. Yeah. Like you guys just all, you all do have a very similar, because I'm thinking of like my neighbors and you. Yes. And Megan. Yes. And then my friend Karen in the UK. And I would say that you would all be so similar in your delivery of information and just like very calm. And mm-hmm. so I don't know. Tone yeah, is Yeah. Cause important. it's really like anxiety provoking, I think, for anybody yeah. coming in for surgery. But I think like, um, I think the tip that you gave about like addressing the um, person and and, mm. ta- and talking through the patient is so important. Yeah. Because um, I had a situation um, a few years ago where I did an epidural um, for the spouse of a physician. Mm-hmm. And they just relayed to me afterwards how much they appreciated um, how I went about it because I actually didn't speak through them, even though like 
you know, you would think, oh, they're the physician. They like know much more about right. this procedure or about the risks. Mm-hmm. I actually um, barely addressed them yeah. because I was like, oh, well, this woman is an adult and like sh- who knows mm-hmm. her body or like needs explanations uh, for these things more than her. She is my patient. Yeah. He is he is not. I care about this person, but like he's not really my patient right, right now. She He'll is. be fine. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> yeah. Um, and, we, and we've uh, him and I have had a few discussions about that. And he was like, yeah, like that's like kind of the first time that uh, someone really only focused on her and like spoke Mm. to her about the procedure. And I think that was something that I didn't even like realize the um, gravity of Mm -hmm. of doing that. But I do try to do that even Mm. with small children and like telling them what's going to happen. And then like sort of afterwards, only when I have a discussion about risk, Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, like no procedure is without risk. That's sort of when I am only really addressing the patients. That's probably Or sorry, of the parents. parents, And then... um, really like saying like our number one job is really to keep you safe. I guess my number one job is to keep you safe in the operating room. Number two job is to keep you comfortable. Right. Um, so that you can have this procedure and, you know. Yeah. Like the number one job always trumps everything else. Yeah. It's good. Like every time I've, yeah, helped, been there while a student or something is getting put to sleep or just even numbed or like whatever the mm-hmm. whole thing is. It's always been pretty pleasant. But there's the odd like whack out and stuff but usually it's to me which I'm like that's almost nice if you have somebody that is really familiar with the individual because right, right. like if they do you know lash out a little bit it's like that person probably knows how to give them what they need I suppose mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. Yeah. and I guess that's the important of like trying to make the first time mm-hmm. great that's or true. better yep. or as, as good as it could be because I think it's only when things have gone really um not as good as maybe they could have gone and then they have to keep coming back for mm-hmm. procedures and then it's like oh this is really like just spiraling. (laughs) When so often, like going back to like, what is the function of this behavior? A lot of it's time, it's communication or control. And so much of these, if it's like a student with really complex needs and autism, they're, they feel so out of control all the time where it's just like, they never know where they're going or like they go to a million appointments and it's just like, no one actually ever tells them what they're doing. So it's just like another instance, but you know, even, I don't know, more intense because it's Mm -hmm. not only do I have no control over what's going on? I actually don't know what's going on. <laughs> so yeah. now, now it's like a mystery as well. And oh, who is that? And what are they doing? And why are they coming closer to me? And whatever. So just control is a big thing. Yeah. 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 And I guess that's um, kind of leads back into the importance of like the social story. Yep. And just so that you can g- have more familiarity yeah. when these things have to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Um, any other like pearls of wisdom that you'd like to give us? <sighs> what else is there? I guess like, I think that's really it. I suppose. Yeah. It's when it's, people are nonverbal and I suppose like you would encounter that a lot with elderly people as well that have suffered strokes. Absolutely. And, who have yeah. suffered strokes or just like are very, um, have neurocognitive dysfunction mm-hmm. now at this point in their life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Same kind of, I guess it's the same sort of approach where it's just you're still in there. Or yeah, you, just, you act like they still are. You know what I mean? Yeah, because you just don't really know. Yeah. Yeah, what it's they're just, like kind of picking up. And it costs up. nothing <laughs> too. You know, it's free to just like talk through them. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's such a that's such a good point. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, I suppose like no behavior is personal when it comes to things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I guess a joint thing about the parents and the young person would be like, everybody just wants to feel in control and they want to feel right. understood, I suppose. Mm-hmm. So like, however you can support them feeling sort of in control <laughs> is useful. Is useful. Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, that's such a good point actually about um, about control. Cause like, I don't like to relinquish control. Well, I was thinking the same thing where I'm like, <laughs> even like an epidural and stuff, like that was always kind of like, yeah, we'll see how it goes. And I'm so happy I got it twice, mm-hmm. but I'm just like, that was my only drawback was like, well, what if I can't use my legs? Like I want like the option, mm-hmm. like I want to still control my legs or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, Something that you've like created in your head as an, yeah. as an issue with whatever procedure. Which it was completely fine. It yeah. was totally fine. But I'm like, yeah, I don't know if you don't want to give that up. And mm-hmm. yeah, thank goodness for walking epidurals. Oh, God bless. What a, I what could a do a treat. whole episode where it would literally just be me being like, um, if you're listening out there, just get an epidural. <laughs> you just, just do it. <laughs> We live in Canada. It's essentially free. Just yeah, like, oh yeah. God, could not recommend it more. Like yeah. you can have 
Then you just eat Sour Patch Kids with your husband and watch Seinfeld. And then someone tells you to push and it's gorgeous. And it's gorgeous. Yes. <laughs> when it works really good, it works really good. Yeah. 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 hundred <laughs> percent. Well, thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. Um, I just feel like you're a wealth of knowledge. And I always, um, even outside of the podcast, always like appreciate your perspective on things. Well, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate yours too. Yeah. I, you know me. I'm always digging for your medical stories. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Always digging. <laughs> Yeah. And um, I thought too, before we end off, I would just mention that uh, we recently went through accreditation, which sounds very similar to what your school had to go through yes. with like being evaluated yeah. and like making sure um, residents are not only being uh, well treated, but that like education standards are met and yes. like teaching standards are met. Um, and that went very well, thank, oh, great. thankfully, um, because we have an amazing program. We have an amazing program director um, and many, many people were involved in making uh, sure that the accreditation process went very smoothly and we passed with no recommendations, hey. which is great. But the podcast yeah. was recognized as a leading practice initiative. So Get I just wanted out. to mention well, no that. Surprise here. I'm a big yeah, fan. Which is so, <laughs> it's so lovely. Obviously, um, Alan and myself and Sebastian did not uh, start this podcast with like intent to, uh, of recognition, but I think we did it with like intent to spread information yes. and like talk about really interesting things. Mm -hmm. And we're all three of us like very, especially Alan, very creative people. Um, and it's been a really good outlet for um, like educational resources. And we've learned so much during the podcast. And I just thought it was like a very lovely. That's great. Thing I mean, you guys are sharing such that. valuable things. I've learned yeah. tons. And some yeah. of it is like very over my head, but I still try my best. Yeah. Well, like you said, that you listened to the breastfeeding episode, right? Loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Loved that one. There's like quite a few that I really enjoyed. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for my coming. Pleasure. And then hopefully um, my plan for this episode is that um, we'll have some patient partners come on as oh, well great. and talk about how yeah. their experiences have been bringing um, their loved ones yeah. um, into uh, into the hospital for different procedures. And then um, hopefully we'll also hear from some of our staff about uh, different things that they have experienced that have worked really well, including pre-medication. Great. Giving certain um, medications ahead of time, maybe an apple juice or other ways um, to try to make things more comfortable for everybody involved. Great. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. My pleasure. You've been listening to Airway Breathing Conversation, a podcast hosted and presented by the anesthesiology residents at the University of Saskatchewan. Please note that while this podcast is run by healthcare professionals, it is intended for educational and entertainment purposes only. We are very thankful to our guests for taking the time to share their wisdom with us this episode, and a very special thanks to you, our listeners, for tuning in. Don't forget to follow us and our associated USASC Anesthesia accounts on social media. You can find all our social media links on our Linktree page at linktree abc underscore podcast. You can also find the department's social media links on their Linktree page at linktr.ee slash usask underscore anesthesia. We'll see you next episode, but until then, stay calm, take a breath, and always remember your ABCs.